the Minister of Higher Education and Training, the Minister of Science and Technology, the Minister of Home Affairs, and Minister of Education. She has also held positions as Deputy Chief Whip of the ANC in the National Assembly, Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces in 1998, and its Chairperson from 1999 to 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, we must once again acknowledge the inspiring Dr. Pandor, a global beacon of inspiration. She stands as a testament to unwavering conviction. Beyond being a female pioneer, Dr. Pando's steadfast commitment to advocating for the freedom of Palestine, as well as the oppressed all over the world, resonates as a symbol of courage and resilience. We take pride in her contributions, recognizing the impact she has had on both our nation and the world. Your hands for the incredible Dr. Naledi Pandal. Um, so allow me to begin by greeting everyone present here with the universal greeting, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What a great honor and privilege it is to have the opportunity to be with you this morning. I wish to pay particular tribute to the leadership of Masjid al Quds, as well as the executive committee to my dear comrade and friend, Mr. Suleiman Mohammed, and all, and of course, Auntie Zora, because without you, he wouldn't do all the things that he does, and all who are responsible for this wonderful function today. I know that all of us, as women who have been honored with an opportunity to speak here today, we feel deeply privileged to be given that chance. I wish to express my deep appreciation and admiration for all the speakers on the program, including the wonderful program director. Somehow, the organizers succeeded in gathering what I believe is an illustrious collective of women leaders reminiscent of the women of August 9, 1956. I wish to mirror the earlier speakers, particularly acting judge president, by talking about family. Many people don't know much about me because I don't talk about myself very much. I'm a child of political leaders and exiled leaders of South Africa. Both my father and my grandfather were in the treason trial of 1959. And after, with a wonderful argument of the lawyers at that time, after the presentation of very weak evidence by the state, all 156 treason trialists were acquitted, if you recall that history. So at the end of that trial, which had lasted quite a long time, my father was directed by his organization then, the ANC, that he should leave the country and join the international mobilization uh, campaign of the ANC out of South Africa. So as children, we were bundled into this car, and I just remember, I was six years old, but I remember we were bundled into this car, and we had no idea what was happening, and it was late at night. And the next day, we found ourselves in a really awful house in Masero Lesotho, and we wondered what had happened to our home, why our parents were making us go through this, and what would come the next day. We lived in Lesotho for about four years. 
We started primary school there, and uh, it wasn't a good experience because we couldn't speak any other language except English. Uh, so we had to quickly learn a few words of Sisutu. And also, we, we just seemed strange. Our parents were under constant threat. And yet, our mother was absolutely amazing. My mum was a very quiet lady. She was not of high stature, small lady, but she had seven huge children, including myself. <laughs> and the thing about her was she believed very much in family. And so we always somehow stuck together. The other thing was she believed in education. And so small as she was, you dare not do your homework, you got the pinch. Small as she was, you dare not be good. When dad came home from whatever assignment, you were in trouble. So she kept us on the straight and narrow path. And I suppose to some degree, it is because of her that I'm often described by some people as difficult, um, as a bit stiff. Uh, they don't know that I'm also very humorous. Um, and uh, somewhat overdevoted to a diary to work. Uh, she was very hardworking, my mom. Uh, taught us a humility, taught us to respect all, all people. And I would see her giving away stuff to poor people, always. You know, um, and somehow she nurtured an attitude, I think, of service in all of us. Of course, my dad was our dad, very tough, very busy, always in one camp or another. We got little gifts from Vietnam, from Algeria, from Russia, you know, so he was all over, busy, as part of the struggle, but also a very strong person. And the one thing I got from my father was education about the struggle, it was politics, it was history was reading, was love of knowledge. One of his uh, protectors, when my dad became a deputy minister in our first democratic government, and one of his protectors always used to laugh, and he said, Menir Matthews read from Beeld to Rapport to Sunday Times, City Press, and everything. And Menir Matthews was exactly like that. So we learned this love of reading from him. But the beginnings are very humble. My grandfather was Professor Z.K. Matthews. Um, he was a, a lecturer at the University of Fort Air, and he was the uh, first African to graduate from a South African university. Now, the interesting thing about him is that in the early 50s, at a conference in Craddock in the Eastern Cape, speaking as acting president of the African National Congress, he proposed that the ANC should call a Congress of the People at which a Freedom Charter would be drafted to set out what the future constitutional framework of South Africa would be. The conference accepted his proposal, and all of you would know from history, in 1955, a Freedom Charter was adopted, and it has shaped and influenced the Constitution, and particularly the Bill of Rights we have today. But where did Z.K. Matthews come from? So my dad told me that my grandfather went to school in Kimberley. He was born on some farm in a rural part of the Northern Cape. And they had schools in Kimberley, so families had to move there. His father was a miner in the diamond mines in Kimberley. And they had come from Botswana 
to South Africa. So those were our beginnings. And my grandfather surprised everybody at school by coming first in every grade. And usually as African people, apparently, you would stop at about standard five. It was unusual to go beyond that because then the money issue, there weren't schools for uh, black people at that time beyond that level. But uh, a teacher in the school who became a famous South African mathematician realized there's something in this boy. And he went to my grandfather's father and said, I wish to put Zachariah into the bursary application for standard six. I think he'll, he'll pass. And my great-grandfather apparently said, no, man. Yeah, our people can't perform at that level. And the teacher insisted. Let him, let him write the, the exam for the scholarship. And he wrote it, passed it, got through standard six, continued writing for other scholarships, got through matric, and then went to University of Forte, whose history I hope you know. So it's this grandfather who's the son of a minor the diamond mine, who has given life to we who stand here today. I just thought it's important, it's important sometimes to understand who some of these people uh, we see on these uh, stages are. But let me say what I received from home was the love for education and particularly the belief that everyone has talent. And if they have the opportunity of education, their talent will be nurtured and will be brought into service to humanity. And so I do believe for South Africa that one of the matters we must attend to is both our quality of education but also the widening of opportunities for all our young people, all of them, because we are wasting talent at present, and we've got to try to do better. So all of this background has given life to my desire to always try and strive for a better world. It is this striving that has led me to admire the liberation movement, particularly the African National Congress, and what it did over many decades to struggle to bring freedom to our country. I also see this wonderful link between our own struggle for freedom and the struggle of the people of Palestine. And I believe it is the common features of oppression and colonialism which make it absolutely imperative that we as South Africans cannot desert the people of Palestine until they enjoy freedom and justice just as we do. Of course, we, we won't uh, be able, I won't uh, encourage you, we won't be able to take up the rifle. Sometimes I wish I could. We won't be able to take up the rifle, but in every way that we can, we must strive to be part of that campaign. We must strive to be part of this worthy fight for freedom. I believe that our history has made us right for such, and that it is only us South Africans who can continue to articulate support for and to campaign to ensure the world is alert 
that the people of Palestine are as deserving of freedom as every person is. We, as a country and as a people, have been granted the wonder of having waged a struggle together. And I have no doubt in my mind that our struggle was one of diverse people. All of us participated. I know that when a boycott was called, all of you stayed at home. Very few walked out, the few collaborators. But in the main, we respected the underground calls. So knowing that you have that discipline, knowing that you have that understanding of struggle, I have no doubt that you can be and will be among the leading lights of the Palestinian struggle for freedom. And what I ask of you, as we continue to enjoy in the struggle, is do what you can. This doesn't require huge sums of money, nor does it require taking up a rifle. It requires you using independent newspapers of Dr. Iqbal Survey and writing a letter every week. It requires you using social media and generating petitions of a million people every week. It requires you putting together a team of 500 men and women who will write to the European Parliament every day. It requires you putting up a team of 500 men and women who will write to the Congress of the United States of America every day. If we make the Palestinian struggle visible, if we make the desire for freedom our desire and communicate it regularly and effectively, the world begins to notice and action will be taken. But if we act in terms of instances of protest, instances of public campaign, instances of speaking out, it doesn't assist the cause. So I do ask you that let us be methodical in how we approach this matter. The United States of America in Congress has passed a, well, adopted a draft bill that seeks to call on the executive to review the relationship between the United States of America and South Africa. And they've cited me in that legislation as a very troublesome person, <laughs> although I'm a very nice person. <laughs> and I have noted that in South Africa, we've been a bit silent about this. I think we need to speak up, you know? We need to speak for our country. We need to say, as the people of South Africa, we believe it is correct to support those who are oppressed. We believe it is correct to oppose neo-colonial oppression. We believe that what Israel is doing is harming a people, and as South Africans, we will not tolerate genocide. And we should say, as I have said to them, that actually, it is you in the West who've been telling us how important human rights are. We are merely acting in terms of the lessons you have communicated to us. You were leading forces in crafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our support for the people of Palestine echoes the key content of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the key content of the Charter of the United Nations. So in terms of international law, our action, our aspiration, our desire for freedom and justice for the people of Palestine reflects the ideal and best frameworks of the world. And we need to say that clearly. 
Because I believe it is important as human beings that we do not allow the world to accept less than the human rights standards that have been set out in international law. We should publicly attach all leaders to respect in practical terms for international law. I say that not because I believe international law is perfect, but because I'm afraid of who might try to craft new frameworks which reflect a very troubling unipolar geopolitical world. At least what we have is a good attempt at multipolarity. And if we allow it to be interfered with by not reacting, we will rue the day and we will regret that we would have allowed a unipolarity in the geopolitical context that would seek to be master over all of us. So I ask you to be active. Now, program director, before you stop me, let me go to my notes. I wish to say that I believe as a global community, we are in a complex search for the good. Because so much of what is negative has dominated the world for so many decades. And what we need is a greater assertion and search for the good in practical terms. This good, as I have said, lies in the contents of the Freedom Charter adopted by the African National Congress, lies in the United Nations Charter, lies in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and lies in our Constitution, particularly its Bill of Rights. Do you know that in our Constitution, in the chapter on the security forces, there's a clause which states that a soldier has the right to refuse to execute an inhumane directive from their leader. It's one of the few constitutions that does that. So if an illegal instruction which causes harm is given by a general to a member of our defense force, they are legally protected by the constitution that they can refuse to execute that decision. We only wish that Israel had similar provisions in their laws because their soldiers are executing the most illegal directions and instructions from the leadership of Israel. So I applaud South Africa for including such a clause in the constitution of our country. And I think we don't spend enough time extolling the virtues, acting judge president, of our constitution which really, I think, is a most progressive constitution that ensures that we enjoy the most marvelous opportunity of human rights. And it is something we should share with the world. Part of the difficulty of achieving success in this complex search for good lies in the increasing absence of rationality in our world. The influence of social media, the influence of misinformation is really quite frightening. There are certain people that we elect to public office and you look at them and you become embarrassed. How did this person get to be elected? Irrational? ethnic chauvinist, anti-equality. How are such people chosen? I think we need a good dose of respect for logic and rationality in our country. And when leaders speak in a way that clearly indicates that it is discrimination or prejudice talking, we should show them the door and be clear 
about doing so. I am very influenced by the intellectual tradition of people such as W.E.B. Du Bois, the American political scientist and educator who spoke in his marvelous essay, The Talented Tenth, about the fact that racism should not lead you to believe that people don't have intellectual worth because of their color or their class or location. That in fact, in every nation, there is a pool, what he called a talented tent, that can make a massive difference in the progress and direction of society. And it is this talented tenth that I'm always looking for. I believe the proportion is far larger, but Dubois was a great intellectual, and his essay still stands as an iconic perspective on how we should seek to defeat racism and discrimination. <coughs> As we look for rationality, we also must admire Nelson Mandela. What kind of person spends 27 years in prison and then comes out and stands at the balcony of the city hall at, facing the grand parade and says, I am your humble servant? His first words, tell me what you wish me to do for you. 27 years in prison, and he comes out and says, I'm ready to serve. Not I'm the marvelous Mandela, you've all been protesting for my release, here I am, I'm ready for the Mercedes Benz, oh no. He says, tell me how I can serve you. This is a rationality that we wish to see. Or Albertina Sisulu, or Amina Kachalia, or Helen Joseph. What do we learn from these historic individuals? As was said by Ms. Layla Parker, we learn of fortitude, we learn of courage, we learn of determination. But for me, when I say the names, Albertina Sisulu, Amina Kachalia, Helen Joseph, and of course, I add Sophie de Brain, I think diversity. I think inclusion. I think the beauty of South Africa. Diversity and inclusion. And this is what I believe we need to strive for as Muslims in our country, to share perspectives on values and principles with our broader society. I was so thrilled when Reverend Frank Chikani and a delegation of the South African Council of Churches decided in 2023 to go and spend the December Christmas period in Palestine with Christians in the occupied territories. Because what they did, they brought back a learning for all of us that this struggle of the Palestinian people is a very broad human rights struggle involving so many issues of dominance and oppression. So as we work on the campaign I have proposed, let us work with communities throughout our country. Let us hold hands across faiths. Let us work with women's organizations, youth organizations. Let us make this a struggle of diversity because in diversity and its joining lies strength. So we must never create an impression that the freedom struggle of the people of Palestine is a struggle about our religion. It is a struggle of human rights and justice and we need to be saying that very clearly by working with all who support freedom and justice. I can imagine the kind of national movement we might build should we set about such a cause. So, 
Let me close by saying South Africa will continue, I understand, from the government, our fight against the oppression of the people of Israel. I've been assured by the recent statements of government and my own conversations with members of the leadership of the African National Congress. But I think we should continue always to engage because I think, uh, as I know personally, pressure is put upon you when you take up this cause. And the pressure can be weighty. So let us show the South African government that we expect that they will continue to wage the fight in the International Court of Justice, that they will continue as the ANC to have solidarity with the people of Palestine. We know no other party will. So let us make sure they understand our expectations and that in this particular fight, we will stand with them shoulder to shoulder as we stand with the people of Palestine. So I thank you very much for having been here to honor these amazing women, Ms. Leila Parker, Hafiza Sadia Roika, Aisha Fafri, Rehana Khan Parker, Fatima Jokut, and Acting Judge President Patricia Goliath. Ma'am, you remind me of my husband. <laughs> of, of small stature, but powerful, powerful <laughs> me. So again, I wish to thank all those who have put this wonderful program together for honoring all of us by allowing us to be present here and by being so patient as to listen to us. And to all those like Dr. Suleiman who've had to listen to me all this week, if I bored you, please do forgive me. I've tried my best. Shukran and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.